Thanks, mate. Good evening, everybody. Our conviction at Hope Reformed Baptist Church and the reason why we do prayer meetings like this and learn about historic revivals is because the new covenant inaugurated and uh, established in the blood of Jesus Christ who uh, opened up and started an entire new chapter of history. The new covenant is the age or the season of revivals. That's one of the ways we should think about what Jesus has established, what Jesus has done what Jesus enacted by sending down the Holy Spirit. He has established that the new covenant is the age or is the season of messianic spirit-born revivals. When kings and nations and Gentiles and all people groups are brought at differing times to God in worship through the name of Jesus Christ. That's the conviction. That's The, the new covenant is not just uh, the same thing in history happening as the old covenant but the people of God worship differently. That's, that's not all the new covenant is. The new covenant has established in time and place history a, a, an increase, an acceleration, a catalyst, a change in the, the kind of way that God saves and the kind of way that God works in the world. So the new covenant is the age and season of revivals. Or in other words, it's the age of missions. Revivals is what God does and we see it and praise him. Missions is what we do, that by God's grace and by his spirit we go. Since the new covenant is the age of revivals, and as Chris read for us, all the coastlands will be glad, therefore we do missions and we send people. Or we could say that the new covenant is the age or season of the times of refreshing that Peter promised in Acts chapter 3. Repent that the Lord may send upon you times of refreshing from the Lord. Or as Psalm 72 verse 11 said, may all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. A promise or a prophecy looking forward to Jesus and what will happen through him. Or Psalm 22 verse 17. Psalm 22 is largely a prophetic uh, psalm about the Messiah's suffering and his brutal death. And then verse 17 says, uh, sorry, verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. So nations are large groups. All the families within those nations, the tribes, the clans, shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. So the psalmist, before Jesus ever had come, a long time before, uh, he prophesied and gave us this link in his uh, theology and in his uh, inspiration of the scripture. He says, the reason that families and people groups will worship Jesus is because the Jesus, is, it, Jesus is the king over all kings and he is the Lord of lords. So as long as Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords, he will press his authority into the world in and through his reign and receive worship from all, not every person, but all peoples eventually. Or as Psalm 97 verse 1 said that Chris read for us, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Well, tonight we're going to study a revival or a series of them that happened in one of those coastlands. Uh, 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 before we run ahead of ourselves, you're on a coastland when, from the psalmist who wrote those things about the coastlands in distant antipodes and the opposite parts of the globe. That's us. We are one of those coastlands. Our land is girt by sea. We are, de by definition, a coastland. Uh, Australia, but also all of the coastlands in and throughout the Pacific. Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, or specifically, our focus on tonight is the revival and the missionary work in Fiji. Represent Inia, Bula Vinaka, brother, as they say, uh, all the rest of the islanders. Sup? Uh, <laughs> we, we go all the way back to the 1800s. Uh, there's, there's so much rich history that would be tremendous to look into around the islands and the uh, Polynesian, Micronesian, Melanesian nations, but... I'm really sorry for how quickly I'm saying all of those. Uh, I'm going to keep on saying them quicker just to challenge you, sister. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we're going to start at about the 1800s when uh, the missionaries who were originally from UK, but actually from Australia, Samuel Marsden and Samuel Lee, who were um, uh, Methodist missionaries in Australia, they started reaching out to the Maoris and other Polynesian islands. And in 1814... 
Samuel Marsden made his first, he was the age of 50, and after years of building networks and sending uh, messages and talking with Polynesia, uh, with, with uh, Maori chiefs back and forth, he was finally able to take a boat of Christians um, and, uh, and Maori chiefs from Sydney over to uh, New Zealand, and they arrived on Sunday, December 25, Christmas Day. And Samuel Marsden's sermon on that day with uh, Maori chiefs and uh, a few other Christians from Australia was Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. That first service marked conversions of multiple people and was the beginning of a tremendous wave of conversions that would come throughout the following years. Uh, but it wasn't just the Australians. There was also uh, the London Missionary Society crew from uh, uh, London, obviously, who in the earlier, actually, earlier than the Australian missionaries were coming over, the UK missionaries, the London Missionary Society, in 1796 actually sent a crew of 30 missionaries along with William Jones, uh, James Wilson, sorry. Uh, James Wilson uh, came over from uh, England. He was a converted seafarer. And so he was a traveler and a voyager, and he got converted, and he took 30 missionaries over. Some of them went to Tahiti. Some of them got dropped off in Fiji. Uh, uh, I got it written down here somewhere. Uh, into Tonga, sorry. And uh, others went into uh, 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 Marquesas. But of those 30 missionaries, because of the islander savagery, which is probably news to nobody, um, but also because of the... Uh, um, hardened relationships between the islanders and white folk because for decades before the missionaries got there, uh, voyagers, whalers, uh, sealers, um, and other sailors of some kind had been coming through those islands and often been taking advantage of people or even acting the Viking and sort of raping and pillaging all throughout multiple villages. So a lot of the um, islander folk had become uh, weary of the Europeans and uh, that is the result of sin. So it was very hard for the missionaries to make, uh, gr take ground in, their, in those early years from the UK, 1796. There was cannibalism in those areas, widow strangling. That would mean that if a man died, his widow was killed uh, on his, at, at his funeral um, so that she would not go, go on to uh, become another man's. They would kill her. Sometimes they would just bury her alive. Um, there was fatal child beatings. They would beat children for minor disobediences against trees until dead. Uh, there was constant tribal warfare. Uh, spiritually, there was animism. And in other words, there was very strong demonic strongholds, Paul calls them, of the dark religion that we know as heathenism. Most of the missionaries that went to Tahiti left and went to Australia. Two left the faith and married locals and became Tahitians. Of those that went to Tonga, three were massacred. The rest ran to Australia. One of them apostatized and became a savage. And others who went to Marquesas, uh, all of them returned home back to England. So it was, uh, that missionary journey was marked by initial failure. Uh, no immediate fruit and very uh, moral, uh, demoralizing sort of uh, results. However, in Tahiti, the gospel had taken root because the king had heard the gospel and was thinking about the gospel, or, well, you know, thinking about this new religion, and he was giving some thought to it when rebels rose up against him, and uh, when the missionaries had left to go to Australia, the king had run away because the rebels had won, and he started, as you do as a heathen, you start questioning the power and the fidelity and the loyalty of your gods. He had lost. He'd lost his kingdom uh, from the gods that he had served, and so he started questioning his gods, started inquiring about the Christian god that he had started to hear about, and at the same time, uh, Samuel Marsden back in Australia forced the missionaries to go back to Tahiti, die if they need be, but keep on preaching the gospel. And when they came back, they found the king a very changed man. He had uh, converted and to show his, this is something we don't do here, uh, to show the genuineness of his rejection of the false gods he went into the priesthood area and took one of the sacred turtles out of the sacred pond and he killed it and ate it in front of people. 
which is pretty gnarly way to, that's a good testimony. Uh, that's, that's a good su- a Sunday baptism day. Um, and so they uh, obviously thought him sacrilegious and uh, opposed him. Nonetheless, uh, when the missionaries went back, they, they found him somewhat converted. Uh, they, uh, 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 he actually got back in power. And after slow progress, they had over five years, hundreds of converts. Hundreds of converts. Uh, a few years later again in 1815... They had, because all the numbers are a little bit hard to keep in those early years, but in 1815, I believe it was on an Easter Sunday, they had uh, 800 Christians that had met in Tahiti for a mass Christian worship, but at the same time, kind of like the Vikings did when they were coming into England and they learned the Christian holy days when the Christians wouldn't be carrying their swords, they came and uh, surrounded the Christian uh, worship gathering and they uh, began their plans for a massacre. However, the king kept his army well-armed on that day, and he defended all of the Christians, and he won, meaning that, not conversion, but most of the heathens were now wiped out, shall we say, meaning that Christianity had plenty of freedom in Tahiti to continue to spread, and so it did. Praise the Lord. In Tonga, so some of the missionaries went to Tahiti, left, came back. Uh, In Tonga, the missionaries had first landed down in the middle of a 20-year civil war in Tonga. Uh, The missionaries were initially massacred, most of them, uh, but later, in 1826, about 25 years later, two missionaries came, and they had, after 12 months, seven converts. Praise the Lord. Seven souls marked for eternity, purchased by Jesus' blood. Um, uh, India. Inya, you're welcome to correct me here. King Twafa Ahwa. Ah, I'm, I'm nailing it then. That's what, that's what you know. Uh, it's, so you're saying it's irrecognizable from the historic name. Uh, King Tawafa Ahua. Uh, sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. Uh, King Tawafa Ahua. Uh, He was one of the kings in Tonga, uh, sorry, the king of Tonga, and he began hearing the uh, good news presented by these white men about their religion, and he, in questioning his faith, again, this this is one way to ponder the presuppositions that you have in your worldview, he, wondering whether or not his gods were really powerful, were true, and all of this, at the, one of the holy days when the priestess was worshipping one of their gods, uh, you know, their gods uh, making sacrifices, and she was possessed, so she was sort of eyes rolled back and kind of uh, standing up in front of one of their altars, he formed out of soft bark, all of biographers make very clear, it was soft bark, because it's sort of bouncy bark, the banana tree bark, he made a very soft, almost like rubber, club. But it was very soft, you know, styrofoam, wiffle bat sort of stuff, don't, don't get concerned. And he walked up to the possessed priestess and clobbered her over the skull with it um, so that she fell asleep lightly on the ground, okay? It wasn't a coma. She didn't die. uh, But he knocked her out. And everybody watching probably thought what you're thinking. You "You can't do that. Um, That's bad evangelism. That's like Chris Sturton kind of evangelism. Uh, (laughs) But it worked. Everybody was shocked that the gods did nothing, didn't protect her. And here she was still still entranced, lying on the ground. Uh, and so he did that, and then, would you believe it, they were offended, uh, and so they, tr- they poisoned him, uh, and he was dying, but the missionaries gave him some of their Western cures and medicines, and he was brought back from the brink of death, and praise the Lord for his bodily salvation. Psalm 97 verse 10 says, O you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserved that, which means hit them, I looked it up in the Hebrew, hit them in the head with a soft Uh, club. Hate evil, that's what it means. Uh, You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the life of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked, and he rose from his sickbed and got thoroughly converted at that that point. Well, he had a relative who was a chief, a kinsman, on another island, and he uh, traveled to him and basically gave him his testimony um, and uh, told him, that, and you know, really said, listen to these missionaries, they're worth listening to, uh, God has changed my life and changed my soul, and he did another kind of Elijah test of the gods moment, he in the presence, as, as a chief, he had the 
authority to do this. Uh, he got all of the gods from the uh, tribe, from the island, into one spot, all of these totems and these uh, carvings and these uh, uh, wooden, wooden uh, 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 false gods. He put them all in one place, and he basically said, I'm here to prove you or to test you. Uh, and I'm telling you ahead of time so that you know what to do and you can escape if you want. You know, you can do whatever I'm telling you. I'm going to light you all on fire. So if you are real, run away. <laughs> and what does Isaiah tell us about gods without legs made of wood? They can't run. They've got ears. They can't hear. They've got these big googly eyes and they can't see. What does 97 verse 10, Psalm 97 verse uh, 3 tell us? Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. All worshippers of images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. And so they died, they burned, and there was on his island the widespread acceptance of Christianity and the rejection of the gods. In uh, 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 Tonga, this began to spread sort of island to island as chiefs would make the case to other chiefs and, and the spread of uh, the reviving work would go on. Uh, one of the things that the missionaries were very concerned about as the chiefs all started to um, uh, convert was nominalism. Are the people of the tribes j just claiming Christ now and going to church and taking the sacrament uh, because their chiefs did so? Now, there's legitimacy to see that, and it, this happens in in, in uh, patriarchal, hierarchical, highly stratified uh, societies, when one converts, uh, we see that God uses, the, just like in the scripture, when, one, when a man converts, his, his family would come along. So also, we see in these sort of societies, when the chief would convert, it's not just that the rest followed, but many others did convert. They, they weren't denying that. That was, that was happening. That was part of God's instrumental work in and through their society. But their, their questions were just widespread, though, it was questionable. Is everybody coming to church now uh, genuinely born again? But in 18, so that was 1833. In 1834 to 1835, the missionaries wrote in their journal, the baptism from above came down. This is when the, 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 uh, some biographers call it, the, we're not at Fiji yet, but the biographers call it the Tongan Pentecost because of the outpouring of the spirit, the conversions of many, a lot of, a lot of wild signs like we see in the Great Awakening, which um, should not always be. This probably isn't the time for a whole apologetic for bodily uh, crazy uh, effects during revival. But uh, some people want to defend falling on the ground, screaming, crying, shaking, and say, that's the spirit. That's what the spirit does. Uh, other people want to go and say, no, that's fleshly. Maybe it's there so far as to say it's always demonic. Well, uh, Really, what we should say is it's not necessarily uh, evil, fleshly, or demonic, um, but it's also not necessarily spiritual, uh, of the Holy Spirit. It's not as if the Holy Spirit's coming into people and making them do that. It's just the sort of thing. I, I saw this as a nurse. I've seen this even as a pastor. When people get non-spiritual, really bad news or something that causes immense grief, I mean, you can't help it. You're, you're, an, you're an ensouled body and an embodied soul. Your soul and your body interact, and your mind and your flesh interact. People break out into sweats. They faint. They swoon. They, they let out uh, involuntary gasps or cries at, at grief. And, and that's sometimes uh, what was happening throughout the Great Awakening and in the, the Tongan Pentecost as well. This was happening in large, uh, large number. On one of the small islands in Tonga, uh, one, one small local part, small church, local pastor, he was preaching a... a, a, a um, uh, uh, an indigenous pastor, not one of the missionaries, he was there preaching on Jesus, weeping over Jerusalem. Oh, that I would have gathered you under my wings as a mother hen does to her chicks, but you would not believe. Um, and he's preaching on that, and people start falling prostrate and weeping and crying out of their grief over their sin and the sin of those around them. And this is one of the starters of what they called the Pentecost. Uh, uh, over a few days in that island, as it spread also, to central Tonga, 2,000 people were saved over the next three days. And over the next six years, it feels wrong to just sweep over this in such a broad stroke, but it, over six years, there was 9,000 added members of the churches. And remember, the way the Meth these were Methodists. Do you remember last time when we studied W.G. Taylor about um, the way that the Methodists structure their churches? There's the congregants, everybody that's coming, your attendance, 
And then within that, there's the seekers, those who, those who really want to be saved and they believe that God will save them, but, but they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're seekers. They're still drawing, but they're not finally, they're not con- confirmed, they would say. Then there were the um, probationary members who were proven converts, but they weren't proven to be up to the standard of membership yet. And then there were the members who were at church twice a Sunday, at the, sorry, church in the morning, prayer meeting on Sunday night, a midweek gathering, and uh, could give um, evidence that people were being converted through their evangelistic lifestyle. It was just church membership. That's not eldership status. That's just church membership. So the churches weren't growing by 9,000 in six years. They were growing by tens of thousands. The membership grew by 9,000 over six years. Well, as Psalm 97 says, let the many coastlands be glad. They became so uh, overflowing with Pentecostal uh, spirit and fervor that they ended up sending missionaries to Fiji and Samoa. Fiji is where we find ourselves the next 10 minutes or so. Fiji was uh, extremely brutal. They, they, the the same sort of islander um, uh, traditional things, there was widow strangling, clubbing, uh, sorry, uh, killing of children, um, uh, cannibalism. In fact, in Fiji, Part of the uh, social standing was determined by how many people you'd eaten. Um, They had uh, practices where they clubbed the sick and the aged to death, um, or they would bury the sick or the old people alive. Um, And of course, on top of all of their animism and ancestor worship, there was human sacrifice. Missionaries, uh, David Cargill, Methodist missionary, and William Cross, a Methodist missionary, arrived to Fiji in 1835 along with Tongan evangelists and missionaries. And they set up a mission base in Fiji. can't remember the name of the uh, island. Uh, Lakaba. Lekuba. It's an E, though. It just shouldn't be Lekuba. They've misspelled that, uh, if you're asking me. Anyway, they, uh, they, they arrived there and they set up the first mission base in all of Fiji and began translating the Bible. One of the issues with the earlier London Missionary Society um, guys who came in 1796 and largely were killed and thrown out, they were told by their superiors, get there and you're going to find uncivilized savages. You need to civilize them, teach them trade, market, farming, mathematics, civilization, education, clothing, uh, 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 linguistics, writing, and then on the, on the back of civilization, you can bring to them the Christ that has taught us civilization. Um, well, that was entirely backwards. A heathen doesn't need to become U- European or English or Anglo or civilized to be saved. A uh, heathen can be saved as a savage, as a heathen. Um, that was part of their issue and why they had, they didn't really preach the gospel all that much because they were trying to make social civilization inroads. Well, in the second batch in 1835, uh, with the Methodist, I mean, Methodists are not like Methodists today. These Methodists knew how to do one thing, and that was preach the gospel. And so they were preaching the gospel, these two men with their Tongan uh, uh, evangelists. And in 12 months, despite all of the hostility that was against them and the severe threats, they saw 300 converts in their first 12 months. Got a few different stories from the islands that make up uh, Fiji uh, the gospel made it to Ono Island, or Ono Island, um, and there, there was an epidemic. There was sickness that was breaking out, and the chief called on this god that he had heard somewhat about, but didn't embrace as his own, to be healed, and he uh, uh, was saved. And a visiting Tongan preacher and teacher, just at the same time, uh, was arriving to the island as he was sort of calling on this god of the Christians and whatnot, please heal me, please save the people from this epidemic Um, and God answered their prayers. The chief was converted, and uh, as the teaching of this young Tongan man uh, kept going on, a few years later, in 1839, the Methodist missionaries arrived and found uh, 200 converts to baptize and then established a local church. Then there was Lakuba. There you go. And that island... After several years of preaching and translating the Bible from Cross and uh, Cargill, the missionaries saw a significant breakthrough in the early 1840s when enormous numbers of the Fijians, including chiefs, publicly professed faith in Christ. It was a revival that was called a mass conversion and is one of the key moments in the spread of Christianity throughout Fiji. I mean, in 1840. 
And then there was the island of Viwa, another small island. Uh, There, one of the chiefs invited John Cross, a preacher, to his island to start preaching. This was in 1839 uh, to see what this was all about, to invite discussion. And by 1844... Uh, There was uh, churches all over the island, uh, and they had a baptism service on um, uh, one of the local uh, uh, men was leading a a baptism service, and he was preaching uh, to the people about to get baptized, 10 people were to be baptized, and he was preaching to them about upholding their baptism vows, making good on being new creations in Christ, and pressing forward in the faith, and not turning back to the devil and his ancient ways and his lies. And as he was charging these people about to go into the water, uh, Edwin All writes this, it was very affecting to see upwards of, oh sorry, this is one of the uh, missionaries who wrote this down. It was very affecting that as he preached, we saw upwards of a hundred Fijians, many of whom were a few years ago, some of the worst cannibals. Did you know that there's gradations in cannibals? There's a good cannibal. He's not too bad. Um, then there's really bad cannibals, and then down the stream of it, there's Fijians. So one of the worst cannibals, some of the worst cannibals. But imagine this, the people you were fearing your life from, blood in their teeth, threats of genuine cannibalism. And these, many of these missionaries saw their friends and co-missionaries eaten in front of them. That was one of the scare tactics. And they're surrounded by those same people in a service. And he says it was amazing to see upwards of a hundred of these, many of whom were a few years ago some of the worst cannibals in the world, chanting, can you imagine it in the Fijian voice? We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. These voices almost drowned out by cries of broken-hearted penitence. They were singing, they were praising, but then they were even more weeping and calling out to God for salvation from their sin. Within a few days, on that small island, there was 100 converts from that time. Then there's the island of Doi. That'll do. Doi. And uh, there, a local man, Nathani Thataki, was preaching. And uh, he had to stop his preaching at one of the prayer meetings because the people were weeping. And he simply couldn't continue. And it got so loud that he had to stop. And while they were weeping and crying and yelling... He sent one of the deacons, go get one of the English missionaries. I don't know what to do. They've been through revivals with Wesley and whatnot back home. How do you get people to shut up so you can preach the gospel? I don't know. And he came in and tried to preach and couldn't. And so it says in the biography, instead they prayed. Then the Holy Spirit fell. That's all they wrote. <laughs> pretty, pretty simple. Instead, why, why do we need to get in the way of people calling out to God? Let's just call out to God together. And so they prayed and the Holy Spirit fell. There was conversions. There was uh, open confession of sin. There was uh, debts or sins against each other made known and uh, ratified and made good on. And then this was widespread across the community in Ireland, this um, a Pentecostal kind of uh, uh, event. Then there is the island of Mbao. And uh, this shows us that not every, even though in every place there was threats and there was difficulties, um, there was still short periods of difficulty with quick outbreaks in Fiji. But in eastern Fiji, there was actually uh, large areas of great difficulty where for years, uh, difficulty and persecution, even execution, of the uh, missionaries continued. So there was one man, one man who was a king by the name of Tanoa. And... Uh, The missionaries knew him as the man who, when he was offended by a person in his tribe, a a person who, knowing that he'd misspoken, no, just misspoken, he fell on his knees and was crying and praying and pleading that the king would be merciful to him and forgive him. And instead, the king uh, brought him over for a meal. You know, "Let's, let's deal with this. Let's put this behind us. And as he was shaking his arm in a tribal manner, he chopped off the man's arm had his men hold him still, and then he barbecued and ate his arm in front of him, and then the rest, uh, that he was dismembered. Uh, This is the sort of man that the missionaries knew him to be. His own son, he made to be beaten by his own brother. He had his his brother kill his own, kill his son um, for disrespect. He had five wives, and at the time of his death, they were all killed at his burial and thrown into his tomb. And his son, Thakumbau, replaced him as king. It's sort of a uh, uh, Herodian sort of situation. Uh, 
and you know, Thikambal replaced his father and there was great fear. Uh, often the new kings would come into place and they would, they would see that they need to establish their rule and strike fear into people. Some, often they would just use the missionaries, murder them all to make a point. Well, he was a, um, a chief, but at, at this point in the you know, revivals and missionaries, often one of the historical questions that people look back and ask is, well, this isn't genuine revival. This isn't a work of the Holy Spirit. This is just social change. A leader changes, so the society and the people following him change because they're afraid of dying. That's, that's really all that it is. It's largely nominalism, and of course, many of these are secular historians who are trying to remove the supernatural from any of this anyway. Um, now, to some degree, they, they're sort of seeing something right when you read the, 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 word, the, the works, because the, the missionaries and the locals in, Fiji, in the islands, they had this word called lotu which meant a change of life, which kind of in our word means turning or conversion. There was a conversion to Christianity. They used to speak this way. There is first a conversion to Christianity, and then there's a conversion from sin to God. We hear that and go, oh, we shouldn't use that language. But the, the, to the Methodists, this was quite helpful, that they were turning from heathenism to believe in the God of the Bible and his ways. And usually what that would mean is, I'm going to stop cannibalism. I'm going to stop murdering sick people and old people and beating women and killing our children. The, the Western way or the, the Anglo way, the, uh, the Christian way is better. I see it thriving. Uh, we acknowledge that we're not in the right here. And so they would change. That was called lotu, a change, a conversion. But then, now if that's all there was, that would be nominalism. The secular historians are right. It wasn't a real revival. It was just, you know, social um, influence. But the second thing that would come in was, off, was often genuine revival, where the Methodist ecclesiology helps us out. They were bringing people in after three to six months of trying and testing and missionary, uh, sorry, membership standards being tested. So uh, they distinguished, they knew how to distinguish between professors and real converted people. So the, the attendance blew up. When chiefs would get converted, the attendances at church would just blow up, but the membership didn't. You can see this in history that the membership didn't blow up until one of these reported revivals actually struck and then there were members. So this really is the work of the Lord. It wasn't long before, however, Thakambao, the son of the arm-eating man, was converted or Lotu, he changed. He said, let's stop eating people, let's stop killing people left, right and center. All of our soldiers are dying. Um, and then he got a visit from the king of Tonga, whose name is even harder to pronounce. I said it before. I won't try it again. But he ch his baptism name was George, which is much easier to say. So George of Tonga visited uh, uh, the, ki the, the king of um, Fiji and evangelized him. And he told him about the, uh, the salvation in Jesus Christ and forgiveness and the power of the one true God. And eventually, he converted. Truly converted. Not just Lotu, but really born again. In 1857, so this is many years after the other islands had really been uh, largely revived, uh, in 1857, Thakambao dismissed his many wives and with his queen, so he just kept his one first wife, confessed his faith in Christ in baptism. Before a grand multitude, he promised to renounce the devil and all his works, the pomps and vanities of this wicked world, and all the sinful lustings of the flesh. He humbly said, I have been a bad man. I disturbed the country. The missionaries came and asked me to embrace the Christian faith, but I told them that I would persist in fighting. Yet God has singularly preserved my life. I wish now to acknowledge God, the only and the true. He was baptized into the name Ebenezer, and his wife's baptism name was Lydia. They note that at the time of his baptism, standing, celebrating, uh, singing, praying for him were widows of men he had killed, children of whose fathers he had eaten, uh, uh, husbands, uh, men whose wives he had stolen to make in his harem, surrounded by these people, yet by the gospel, they had embraced one another in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 52 verse 15 says, So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, now they see. And that which they have not heard, now they understand. This is the work of a Christian king that when there was warfare against the Christians, 
uh, he, along with his army, did the good thing and defended uh, his people. If the Christian side lost, the Christians and the missionaries were eaten in a public display of cannibalism. If the Christian side won, as many lives were preserved as possible, but they did enforce lotu, not full Christian, but lotu. Stop eating people, stop killing everybody, enough of the capital punishments for everything. Um, so that was one of the ways that, again, the Christian influence, the, the light of the church kept on spreading in and through the chiefs and the kings. As the most powerful chief in Fiji, Thakambao, now Ebenezer, his conversion to Christianity had a ripple effect on other chiefs and other people. He allowed and legitimized the missionaries. Cam cannibalism, tribal warfare, and paganism was in a sharp decline historically. The treatment of the sick, women, aged, and children amped up so that there was even uh, mercy ministries. There was looking after charity. Would you believe it? In this nation, there was charity towards those who needed help instead of killing. And then they looked to Britain for protection and support and modernization and help, including health. And so they seceded to Britain and became a part of her commonwealth. Psalm 97 verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Something that we should be pulling from this. Something that is relatively very recent in our history and fairly close on the map. Is that the new covenant is the age of revivals. It is a season of missions but it is the age of revivals where when the gospel goes, God sends his spirit in power. I think we often have a, tra a trajectory or a um, tendency to so just normalize history. If you ask most Christians in this generation, uh, uh, what's one of the least Christian or even possible to Christianize countries in all of the world, people would just assume, well, that's North Korea. That's like, that's its badge. Uh, it's... How long has it been like that? Has it always been like that? How long will it be like that? Well, it's North Korea. That's, that's their thing. Well, a generation ago, they were the most, one of the highly most revived nations on the planet after the Pyongyang revival, more than a, more than a generation ago, before the Second World War. And, and then it was split in half, and South Korea remains to be one of the highest percentage uh, senders of missionaries per capita of Christians in the, com in the country. Um, there's... Things like that, or even as we now think of Fiji, and we think, what a, you know, that's where my parents went on their honeymoon. You, you Google Fiji and songs, they're all gospel songs. They're beautiful. They're the best gospel songs. They're awesome. Uh, not long ago at all, they were the harshest cannibals in the world. And we get in a, in a habit of thinking, we're under the old covenant system. The devil still holds sway. He is, be, he is still uh, free, uh, enslaving, binding. He has all power and authority, and no one's taken it off him yet. And uh, 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 at some point in the future, people, kings might lie down, the nations might come to him, and God might save people in the coastlands. When really, we st history is proof, scripture is enough proof, but we are in the age when if we see a nation or a country or our nation, country, state or community and think that's just the stats where the highest rates of domestic violence or drunkenness or gambling, all right, that's Australia, per capita in the Western world, that's, that's sort of just how we are. We are challenged by the age that we live in, that is the new covenant age, to remember that the new covenant is the age of revivals. We must believe that God intends to send his Holy Spirit where the gospel is preached. And so we pray. So can you stand up with me? I'm going to pray for our nation, for our church. And when I'm finished, Nathaniel's going to come up and just direct us. Father God, we humbly bend our knees before you and acknowledge that you are the one true living God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternal in glory, infinite in all of your perfections. You are the one true living God. And you put to flight and you put to mockery and you put to open shame those false gods that rise up against your glory, your holiness, and your majesty. Those demons of the uh, ancient times who have dispersed throughout the world to enslave and blinden and uh, mask and uh, butcher human beings and keep their minds in the darkness of ignorance. You have, in your own providence, allowed sin to go to its full extent in many nations. You have 
put between Jerusalem and the first disciples and Fiji, thousands of kilometers of harsh ocean. You put millennia of progress so that ships that could cover those kilometers could be invented and the Antipodes found and Lord just as soon as the great south land was discovered there your faithful people were giving their lives and their lot to see the name of King Jesus spread abroad we thank you that Darwinism fell flat and did not stop the missionaries from coming to evangelize to the heathen we thank you that uh, ideologies and lies and temptations and resistances and lethargy that the devil was sprinkling throughout the church was not able to hold back your faithful people from bringing the gospel with great courage. We don't know all of their names, but Lord God, we love their heritage and their legacy. We thank you for sending them by your spirit. We thank you that we can read of their uh, fruit and we ask for more of them in our day. And we ask for more of your Holy Spirit and his action, his uh, 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 vitality, his strength, his zeal that he brings in a burning flame through the hearts of Christians. We ask for that in our church so that the Solomon Islands can be thoroughly evangelized. Uh, Nepal can be thoroughly evangelized and become a missionary sending nation so that godless governments can be changed, whether lotu or full real conversion. We pray for both, but we pray that in your own providence, um, many would be saved in and through our efforts, in and through uh, the work of your Holy Spirit and the preaching of the gospel. Lord, would you convert um, many millions in Australia, uh, those who represent other distant homelands and cultures who would take it back to their family. Uh, would you change Australian culture to be Christ-honoring? Would you convert our leaders, our prime ministers, our ministers? Would you Lord, convert many of the pastors in pulpits? Would you convert many of the Christians sitting in pews, would you revive us again, O Lord, so that this coastland can be glad and praise in the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray this in his wonderful name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.